plus ratio is a type of social behavior exhibited by humans on Twitter and is a display or attempted display of social dominance. The L refers to lose or loss, as in one might take an L if they have lost some kind of social exchange, and the ratio refers to the numeric value of likes on a tweet versus retweets and comments on that tweet. In the Twitter exchange currently on your screen, Keemstar, a low-ranking male in the YouTube hierarchy who runs a drama alert YouTube channel, which effectively chronicles the ongoing spats of our culture, tweets out, Charlie D'Amelio just unfollowed Lil Huddy. It's going down, hashtag drama alert. In a troop of baboons, this may be, you know, one subordinate male running up into the middle of the group, puffing himself out and shouting to get attention. This is responded to by D'Angelo down below, who tweets, you're a grown ass man, Keem Star, and this would be the equivalent of another baboon coming in and beating the crap out of the first one. As you can see, the L is thinking anybody would care about drama alert here, and the ratio is D'Angelo's comment getting 43.7K likes as compared to the 2,681 likes on the original tweet out by Keem Star. So in this social exchange, Keem has been L plus ratioed. It is not an enviable position to be in. But you don't have to be famous to be L plus ratioed. It's all about the scale of things. If you put out an idea and it gets two likes and 20 comments, odds are you've been L plus ratioed. So today I wanna to talk about an L plus ratio that I was involved in as well as the content of that original L. A few days ago, Carl Kelby, an individual who I had not heard of at this time, tweets out, am I anti-science if I do not believe my ancestor is an ape? Debunked TV, episode 10. And Jackson Weed, friend of the channel, just replies, yes, <laughs> as did I, as did many other individuals, as you can see by the ratio here, four likes, versus 104 comments. This is what you call an annihilation on the L plus ratio scale, particularly given Carl Kelby is not particularly popular on Twitter. But this led me to think, I wonder exactly what this video that he's posted says. Maybe this would be some fun content for YouTube, perhaps of the filler variety. And this journey took me down something of a miniature rabbit hole. And this is because clicking on the link doesn't take you to YouTube as most reasonable and sane links would. Instead, it takes you to a website called Rumble, which I had not heard of until this point. Uh, and here is immediately what affronts your senses the moment you arrive. And that is this. The Rumble homepage, I guess it's not even a homepage. The Rumble page has the video in the center with ads over to the side. Uh, and that ad that you're looking at right now that says Democrats are furious because this biblical secret got revealed video, click here to watch, with a pulsating picture of, I guess, AOC with enlarged eyes, kind of got me thinking about what kind of website this actually is. It's not a neutral one, let's put it that way. Scrolling down, we get some more subtle ads and suggestions, including this one that says, Biden probably wants this video destroyed. US dollar on path towards replacement and the video is like a 140p video of Biden like taking a mask off. The suggested videos over on the side uh, includes a lot of similar material, including what they aren't telling you about uh, Iran, <laughs> Trump's epic response to January 6th committee subpoena, and uh, an ad just from the National Republican Senatorial Committee. So, you know, I'm under no delusion that YouTube is like a totally neutral platform, but this was overt enough to make me want to look into it a little bit more. So I just Googled Rumble, what is it? What do they do? Uh, and they are kind of like a tech company, an online video platform. The cloud service business is known for hosting Truth Social. Obama. And the video platform is popular among the American right, far right users, and has been described as a part of alt tech, which, you know. That's suspicious. 
So this will probably come as no surprise to those of you who have been following this channel for some time, but this is a science channel. So, you know, I have a lot of respect for the peer review process and for consensus. And as a result, I have a particular disdain for this sort of section of the right, the far right, which, you know, <laughs> tends to peddle the conspiracy theories that end up getting dunked on on my channel. So, you know, anti-Semitic ideas, racist ideas. We see a lot of anti-evolution. We see a lot of anti, you know, climate change, so climate change denial. And of course, there's the ever-present anti-vax, specifically the COVID-19 variety. Now, the left has its own issues with sort of homeopathy and their version of the anti-vax stuff. But I see a lot more of these guys coming out of the woodwork on my channel. So my disdain for them is potent. Now, this isn't a politics channel. I have political opinions. You can see some of them on Twitter. This is a channel for science, and I maintain the idea that science in and of itself is not political. It can be used and misused and abused by politicians, but it is not political. It does not aim to reach a certain conclusion. In that sense, sort of what I'm meaning is that data tells the truth. I mean, whatever, like there's nuance there. Obviously, people can be wrong. I'm basically just trying to emphasize that this isn't a political channel, but I will happily dunk on absolutely anybody who's trying to misuse science for politics. Now, unrelated to that, we have also seen our good friend Andrew Tate, <laughs> who has been posting on Rumble since this past August after being banned from YouTube, Andrew Tate is like an old fashioned misogynist in that he will just come out and be like, yeah, you got to train women because they're a lot like dogs and that they're just kind of inferior to men. <laughs> I mean, you know, I don't love that as, as a woman myself. My primitive femoid sensibilities just make me too stupid to understand the depth of the intellectual gems that Andrew Tate is bringing to the table. To get an idea for the Rumble user base, they have actually gotten some backlash from their viewers because they don't allow blatant anti-Semitism and racism, which, you know, that's not a crowd that I would love to be bumming around with personally. Ooh, boo, Gutsy Gibbon, bad look, Chief. You're making the channel political by talking about how you dislike anti-Semitism and racism. I don't care. Anyways, moving back to the funny topic of this weird video by Debunked Ministries. So I saw this and I was like, ooh, Debunked Ministries. I wonder if I can find out more about them. Perhaps they have a website of sorts. And so I clicked around and on top of getting a new ad to the right that says, show kids why socialism is wrong for America. It's got a cartoon eagle holding a no socialism sign. Uh, you can scroll down and get more information. So they've got more information on reasons for hope, but I want to know more about Debunked. So I click on debunk.org and it takes us to their website, which, you know, spoiler alert, because I've already looked into this, doesn't tell us too much, but you can find out more if you dig into their sort of parent corporation. So if you scroll down, Debunked is a division of the Reasons to Hope, a nonprofit organization. All donations are tax deductible. Let's check you out Reasons to Hope. Reasons for Hope, which um, is bragging on their number one book right now by Carl Kelby, one of our individuals who's in the video we're going to watch, has written a book titled Did Jesus Commit Suicide, which is probably going to get my video demonetized. So thank you so much, Carl. I love that. They effectively reach the next generation by boldly and clearly proclaiming the word of God giving reasons to believe and answering real world questions like, you know, did Jesus see he kill himself? Providing engaging and free resources and encouraging parents to be heroes to their children. So you can schedule a speaker to come to like your place, to come to your house and speak. Pastor Frank can come to your house and speak to you over a bowl of, of cereal, your Captain Crunch and hearing why Jesus did not in fact KMS. But the speakers is what got me particularly excited because one of them is our boy, Dan freaking Letha, who, if you remember, is the author of every Answers in Genesis comic ever. So meet Dan. <laughs> 
<laughs> we should watch or we should look at some of his uh some of his delectable comics. This is one of my favorite Dan Letha comics. The, one of the guys says, today's weather forecast is 100% sunshine. <laughs> and the below caption says, tell me again why I should trust scientists' ability to be accurate about life on Earth millions of years ago. <laughs> this is another one that absolutely kills me. It's a woman waiting in like a waiting room and it says, when does a young earth creationist believe in millions of years? When waiting for the news about the condition of a loved one and she's crying and thinking, this is taking so very long. And amidst the sorrow of this drawing, we have the Answers in Genesis logo twice, as well as two Bible verses. And then Dan Lee that has just signed his name two times in case you didn't see it the first time. To me, this feels like if you programmed a robot to be a young earth creationist and then told it to make a comic about the human condition, right? It's just completely absurd and kind of insensitive, to be honest. I guess the point of this is just that all young earth creationist roads eventually lead back to Dan Letha in some way. One of these days we're going to do a video about Dan Letha. Ugh, can't wait. My, my poor sides are in the bust from laughing so hard at all his hilarious comics. Anyways, let's watch this video. Let's see what it has to offer. Maybe our boys, Carl and Bub, will finally be the ones to crack the case and to debunk evolutionary theory. Nothing is impossible, right? They start with this intro, which doesn't have a lot to note. This is Debunk TV. What is truth? What is truth? Truth. Shabam, there it is, the big kahuna, the spicy enchilada, the fizzy lifting drink, the question of the ages. It's the socket wrench, it's the whip-tailed scorpion, it's the Indonesian single moms born in 1957. They are two different things. So, like, truth is basically subjective. Yeah. This is not an evidence problem. This is a worldview thing. No fossilized eyeballs, trust me. This is... TV. So this is like a good intro. It's high quality. Why do I have the sinking feeling that this is going to feel like a conversation about evolution with the managers of my local Lowe's and Mattress Warehouse, respectively? Welcome to Debunk TV. I'm Bub Coons, Carl Corby, right there. How goes it? As always, I'm a blessed man. You are a blessed man. <laughs> yeah. And we're about to do a talk that I think is going to bless lots of other people. We're downgrading from managers to local volunteer coaches of Little League teams. We are in a series on this whole concept of evolution and the possibilities of it. Last week, or the last episode, we covered critical thinking, how to yeah. just parse through some of the information and headlines and stuff that you see in textbooks and look at them critically and come up with your own point of view after you weigh the evidence and, and pay attention to the words. Oh, okay. I like this. This is generally good practice. How are they going to ruin it? Uh, we left last time with this quote. Although... The comparative study of living animals and plants may give very convincing circumstantial evidence. Fossils provide the only historical documentary evidence that life has evolved from simpler to more and more complex forms. I tend to agree that the fossils are very important, even though I sort of take issue with that use of historical and documentary there. So where are they going to take this? That's what we're going to explore. And like our Proverbs verse, seems good, seems right. Till you cross examine you it. The other side. But exactly we're going to hit right. it pretty hard right now yep. with an overview. This is Debunk 16 Fossils Prove Evolution. Oh, sweet. We are done here, baby. Really? Huh? We've unearthed millions of fossils around the world, so with all this evidence, so to speak, it's clear that the fossil record proves evolution, right? Well, actually, no. Oh, no, 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 no. I was going to go watch the Midnight Club. I was going to go do something else, something productive with my evening. What do you mean, no? Didn't when Darwin was alive and hasn't since he's been gone. In fact, Chucky D himself knew this when he wrote the following. Geology assuredly does not reveal any such finely graduated organic chain. And this, perhaps, is the most obvious and gravest objection which can be urged against my theory. The explanation lies, as I believe, in the extreme imperfection of the geological record. Okay. Shit. Oh. Oh. That was in the 
50s. But surely after all the time since Darwin, digging and discovering fossil after fossil, we have a more perfect geological record that supports evolution, right? Yes, thank you. Some reasonable thoughts going on in the head of this narrator. Yes, absolutely. We've been finding more fossils since then, and they further support evolution. He's going to elaborate on that, isn't he? Not even close, bud. But... Listen to how two renowned evolutionary biologists summarized the truth. Instead of finding the slow, smooth, and progressive changes, they saw in the fossil record rapid bursts of change, new species appearing seemingly out of nowhere and then remaining unchanged for millions of years, patterns hauntingly reminiscent of creation. Okay, so one that sources from 1992, and in the case of the hominins alone, so the human fossil record from our ape-like ancestor in the late Miocene, we've more than doubled the fossils that we had since 1992. But two, what you're talking about there is punctuated equilibrium. This is like a well-appreciated aspect of evolution. Of course, what they're going to say, and they do say this later, is that that's just a rescuing device. Anytime science advances, it's actually just to save the previous idea, a way to cope and seethe about being wrong. Despite the fact that every field, including evolutionary biology, but indeed at large in the rest of the sciences, has changed since their inception, it doesn't mean the previous ideas are wrong, it means you're building upon them. The best possible example of this is the theory of relativity and its relationship to Newtonian physics. Newtonian physics work here on Earth, but you need something a little more complicated once you get orbital mechanics involved, right? So we apply relativity on top of Newtonian physics. Newtonian physics didn't start molding at this advancement. It embraced it because the two are related to one another, and the aspects of relativity actually make Newtonian physics make more sense. The fossil record doesn't show gradual change, and every paleontologist has known that ever since Cuvier, or however you pronounce that. No, it's Cuvier. You got that right. What, are you embarrassed that the boys down at the river are going to make fun of you for knowing how to pronounce a Frenchman's name? Like some kind of girl? Also, cool source. It's from 1980, you fucking loser. I'm sorry, I've just already watched this video through once, and I know where it's going, so I'm very cynical. Using old sources is fine, everybody uses old sources, and in fact, they're relevant pretty much constantly. You have to pay homage to these guys who came before, and that particular quote is from Stephen Jay Gould, who was, of course, a master of his craft. However, paleontology is one of those fields that advances pretty rapidly, and every year we're adding more fossils to certain lineages, indeed all lineages where we're currently looking. So what Stephen Jay Gould said back in 1980, before well over half of the hominins were even discovered, this is not going to be very applicable to 2022. Okay, I could go on and on, but there's always going to be opposing views because on both sides of the debate, the same evidence is interpreted through different worldviews. You gotta remember that, people. This is a Ken Ham original, the same evidence, different worldviews, but you do have to appreciate the fact that in the eyes of these guys here at Debunked, there are two worldviews. The atheistic naturalist worldview and a very particular brand of evangelical Christianity that came about in the 1920s with the origin of the Seventh-day Adventists. There are no other worldviews. Muslims, bye. Jewish people, see ya. Hindus, see ya later. Theistic evolutionists, bye-bye. It's only those two and that's it to these people, which is, of course, ridiculous. Facts don't say anything. People say things based on their interpretation of facts influenced by their worldview. But that's a whole other subject, and I don't want to get into it right now. I think his use of the word facts there is pretty telling. It's very clear that this guy, the maker of the video, is not a scientist or science adjacent. Data does need to be interpreted. This is true, but interpretation is putting the data in the light of other variables. Data can speak as well on its own. Like in the case of isotopic analysis, you look at the difference, the ratio between oxygen 18 and oxygen 16 in a given sample. It's either going to favor oxygen 18 or oxygen 16, or it's going to be equal. And each of those results is going to favor a certain paleo environment. It's not very complicated. It's pretty clear cut. 
And there's not a lot of interpretation that needs to be done other than the interpretation that goes on when you look at the numbers and your brain makes the connection between the pattern that we've seen hundreds of thousands of times before and your current set. Instead, hey, let's have a little fun and take a look at some popular secular articles and charts on the fossil record and see if we can learn to separate facts from interpretation of facts by asking a few simple questions. Question one, did the artiste take any artistic license with what I'm looking at here? Check this out because this happens all the time. They're going to complain about the sclera here. Now, we've talked about this, oh, I don't know, dozens of times on this channel, too many times. Creationists get upset when australopiths and other early hominins are represented with having their whites of their eyes visible, the sclera of the eyes. And the reason is because they say apes today, and they mean non-human apes today, don't have the visible whites of the eyes. They don't have whites of the eyes, so this is clearly an attempt to make these artistic renditions, as our narrator just said, look more human. But the problem with that is... And, you know, I'll just keep on saying it until the day I'm in my grave. Apes that are non-human apes today do have white sclera. And we see this all the time. How many times do we have to teach you this lesson, old man? I love the young people. Look, isn't that sweet? So cute and fluffy. Sir, that's a large-bodied early hominin. It would turn an interaction with you into the Gordy attack sequence from the recent film, Nope. Okay, why do you think the artist made these creatures appear more human-like by throwing in an affectionate smile and depicting them hanging out like a human family going to a picnic or something? Why did he draw them walking upright? Why make the shapes and colors of their eyes more human than ape? It's like the world's most depressing drinking game. But what a fish-brained thing to say, no? Why are they depicted with a smile? Because that's what the faces of most African apes already look like. That's just their resting face. They do smile, but they smile for different reasons than we do, at least the adults do anyways. The kids smile for normal, playful reasons. Why are they standing upright? Well, we've beaten this one to death on the channel because australopiths have the entire suite of characteristics that are necessary for bipedalism and preclude other styles of locomotion. This is the anterior frame and magnum with a forward orientation, the bowl-shaped pelvis with anchoring sites for powerful gluteal muscles, the valgus knee, and of course the morphology of the feet, including three arches and an inline helix or big toe. As to why they're arranging like a family, all apes are social when given the opportunity. It's not showing them in a monogamous family, which Australopiths probably didn't live in, although the hominin that lived prior to them, Ardipithecus, probably did based off of its monomorphic characteristics, males and females being the same size and having the same sized canine teeth. Australopiths, on the other hand, are dimorphic in body size with males being significantly larger than females. This is based almost exclusively on the fossil evidence. The only thing that is really up for debate in those characterizations is how much fur would have covered these guys if they were more like modern day African apes or if they were more naked like humans. Is any of it based on actual fossil evidence? Of course not. Sick dude, when in doubt, just lie. You'll come out looking great every time. Why do you think they're being depicted as bipeds? Because they biomechanically couldn't have been anything else other than bipeds when they're on the ground. This is very silly and betrays an extreme lack of even a cursory Google search on this species. But if you want the story of evolution to appear more convincing, you just might fill in missing gaps with your presuppositional imagination. Just saying. <laughs> to anyone who knows what a load of nonsense you just said with regard to the Australopiths, this just makes you look like an even bigger goober. This is giga goober mode. Question two, is the attention-grabbing headline or title supported by actual facts? For instance, take a look at this popular book called Why Evolution is True. Oh, you mean this one, boys? We don't even have to go any further than the jacket on this one, because on it you got a dino evolving into a bird in three simple steps. There you go. But then on the inside, this is written, and I kid you not. The jacket depicts a chronological sequence of fossils showing the evolution of birds. We do not know whether the actual line of descent included, now wait for it, the first three. Say what now? Yeah, now you know it's weird because my copy doesn't say that. Maybe that's because you need to make that little fine print there at the bottom a little bit bigger, huh? 
But more importantly, it's very rare in paleontology or evolutionary biology that someone proposes an anagenetic lineage where one you know, fossil specimen definitively gives rise to another, which gives rise to another, as is simplistically depicted in this sort of dust jacket here at the cover of the book. And in fact, on the back, it says the illustrations are reconstructions by Jason Brogum from Fossil Specimens. And you can find out which individuals these are. They are feasible candidates for a lineage that's anagenetic just like this, but no one wants to say that that's definitely the case because there's no way to know for sure. The point is to show a plausible pathway, not the definitive pathway. Who are these guys? Well, they are real fossils, which is something that is, you know, heavily applied against, implied against in what we just saw. It's implied that these first three don't exist. No. And that dust jacket simply said that we don't know that this is the direct lineage. These are real animals. Compsognathus, Cynornithosaurus, Archaeopteryx, and a modern day heron or something along those lines. These were real creatures that existed and we've got a lot of fossil material for them too, especially Compsognathus and, um, and Archaeopteryx. Although Cynornithosaurus is also quite well represented and is preserved with its feathers still in place. So this is a very well documented transition, at least with regard to the sort of archetypes. Doesn't that mean these three shouldn't be on the cover then? Which means all you got is a modern bird, right? No evolution, just a bird. Talk about worldview filling in gaps. I mean, we just went over this. It's very clear that the author of the video does not understand evolution. And trust me, they will continue to not understand it because I suspect it's actually one of the narrators is actually Kelby. I'm not positive though. What do the graphics on evolutionary charts indicate? I mean, they sure do look convincing. For instance, on this one from the dinosaur book, you got solid red columns and white columns showing gradual progression over time. But let's read the almost imperceptible two-point font over here. It reads, tinted areas indicate solid fossil evidence, which means the white areas represent no solid fossil evidence, right? Okay, then take them away. Uh-oh, looks like patterns hauntingly reminiscent of creation, I'd say, right from their own charts. So that chart actually comes from something called the Dinosaur Data Book, which, as you can see, is from 1998. Now, I was curious about this, so I went ahead and looked up. I'm not a dinosaur person, so I went up and looked some new cladograms, some more recent cladograms, and boy, wouldn't you know it. <laughs> There's just oodles and oodles and oodles of them, many of them showing these transitional species or species that could be transitionals if we weren't trying to avoid drawing a direct lineage. How, how fascinating, what a strange situation we have on our hands here. Wouldn't you think that maybe we would do some of this background information before making a video like this? So what they've done with that dinosaur chart is exactly what is going on kind of with this bird chart, right? You could create a bunch of similar lines here and just delete these, the sort of uh, connecting portions of the cladogram. But what they're doing is effectively akin to saying each of these three fossil species prior to birds on the cover of Evolution is True, why Evolution is True, is its own kind. Compsognathus is its own kind, Cynornithosaurus is its own kind, Archaeopteryx is its own kind, and birds are their own kind. And if you were to show the species that fill in the blanks between uh, Compsognathus and Cynornithosaurus, or Cynornithosaurus and Archaeopteryx, which we have, as you can see on the cladogram on your screen now, if you fill in those blanks, each of those simply becomes its own kind as well. And anything that connects them is uh, is just fable. It's just imagination. Actually, the pattern is hauntingly reminiscent of creation. This is incredibly silly and reveals again, again, a lack of understanding of how evolution actually works and how scientists suss this stuff out. And the same thing goes for the dotted lines on this one. Look at all of them. Just so we're clear, dotted lines indicate zero evidence. Remove them and what do you get? No transitional forms or evidence of gradual progression. A bat is a bat, a kangaroo is a kangaroo, and a horse is a horse. Of course, of course, unless of course the horse is Mr. Ed. Wow, sick source, dude. From 1978. Just for comparison, we had like four or maybe five of the two dozen hominins that we have today in 1978 significantly less of the cetacean line, less of the horse line, less of the uh, theropod dinosaur to modern birds line, less of the tetrapod line, actually none of the tetrapod line, we didn't even have Tiktaalik yet. Like, come on guys. <laughs> I know that you guys can use Google and find more up-to-date charts. Look, people, 
all I'm saying here is if you got facts, put them in there. If you don't, leave them out. But don't draw downright dubious daft, dare I declare, dunderheaded dotted lines of deliberate deception dogmatically and dastardly doodle to disguise definitive data. No, just admit what you actually see. Overwhelming evidence of living things, according to their kinds, suddenly appearing. Which, as a reminder, is exactly what the Bible teaches. Now, I don't even have time to get into TV, movies, and documentaries. All I ask is that you use the same line of questioning when you watch them. And, in summary, we agree with Mr. D. Geology is sure does not reveal any such finely graduated organic chain. Not then, not now, not ever. And that means the whole idea that the fossil record proves evolution has been debunked. Adios. We went through this piece by piece so you understand why it's dumb. Now let's hear what our boys Carl and what was his name? The Carl and it's gonna come to me. It's gonna come to me. Carl and but Bud? Is it Bud? It was Bub. Carl and Bub. So, and I like that we stick right in there. It's not about a per the person, it's about nope. the ideas or the ideology, right. and it's about exploring that, which we're gonna do this whole episode. Right. So, if you've seen the original video, although you probably haven't, you've probably already noticed that I've trimmed a little bit of fat, and I'm going to continue to do so. We're gonna hit the highlights and the new information that wasn't already covered in their little short animated video that we already watched to save both of us some time and liver cells. Carl and Bub briefly lament the fact that the original abiogenesis to the primary domains of life chart has in fact changed and that they no longer show a single common ancestor yielding all of the domains, but rather several different communities. Something that has been bopping around. I don't do the abiogenesis or even very early prokaryotic to eukaryotic evolution very much, but I've heard some reasonable arguments for it on the basis of like the origin of different organelles, at least in the case of eukaryotes. Uh, and then they say this. It's kind of interesting to me. We don't know how in the world we got the first cell to evolve, nope. but now we got a whole family of cells evolving. And then they all become something else. <laughs> And yeah. notice all the crossover back and forth yeah. on this chart here. Guys, this chart is not showing you that one thing turned into something else. As a minimum, it's showing you that a family turned into something. How do you get, if you can't get an individual to evolve, how do you get a family to evolve? It's just like just a bad uh, GPS system is all it looks like to me. It's just, it's a mess. Individuals don't evolve, populations evolve. Abiogenesis is the proposed idea for the origin of the first actual life, but the proliferation after that evolution actually starts to take place um, on, once you've got like a population to actually act upon because for evolution to occur, you need mutation and you need natural selection, which relies on differential reproductive success, which can't happen unless there's variation in a population. So original cell pops up under whatever conditions that it does, RNA world, metabolism first, whatever, it proliferates into several different, you know, members of a single population. Those population members have differences about them, and then the population itself can evolve. This is like the uber mega basic concept in biology that individuals don't evolve, populations do. As for the chart looking like a mess, I, I suppose it would to someone who's not a biologist. To me, the layout or city plan of a sewage system can look like a mess, but then again, I'm not a city planner or a plumber. If you're not an expert in the field, or at least well-versed in the field, it doesn't tend to make a lot of sense right off the bat, unless there's been a lot of study beforehand, which I promise you, there wasn't here for reasons we will talk about later. Yes. But I mean, I'm sure it all makes sense to someone, but... Yeah, mostly biologists. The two briefly discuss theistic evolution and imply that there are scriptural problems with it, which, you know, I know several theists who would beg to differ. And then they go back to talking about the dinosaur chart from the video that we already covered. They, you know, are upset about the fact that there is some unknown there, again, seemingly forgetting the fact that this video was made last week and that chart is from 30 years ago. So perhaps there has been some discovery since then. You've probably heard the statistic that these days we're pulling up a new species of dinosaur a week which is a lot. You know, I spend a lot of time going over the claims of young Earth creationists, old Earth creationists, and intelligent design advocates, and the claims that I cover range wildly from the pure, unadulterated amateur to, like, the PhD who just so happens to be YEC. Even though there's, like, ten of them, they do actually exist, the young Earth creationist PhDs. 
And with the PhDs, I tend to think to myself, there's either some like, you know, diagnosable psychological pathological level cognitive dissonance going on here, or perhaps they're doing it intentionally. They're being deceptive because I find it hard to believe, as you've seen in some of the previous videos, that a guy like Jason Lyle is capable of utilizing such a bad argument for young earth creationism as, you know, the lure recession hypothesis that they tend to put forward. On the part of the amateurs, I tend to think that they're just going along with it, which is why I think it's so interesting that they say what they say next. It, it's sometimes you think this, the, 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 these people must be doing it on purpose. Yeah. Because wh why is the tiniest thing the most important thing? Over there, okay. Tinted areas indicate the real fossil record. Yep. Solid fossil evidence is the Why tinted that areas. Off? Yeah, the tinted areas. Um, you know, th th it's an interesting point in this yeah. one that look there. I believe that there are those that this is just all they know. I was one. Yeah, it's all I knew. Then there are those that know that this doesn't work, and there is absolutely yeah. some deception going on. Yeah. And these kind of things make you lead, uh, lean you to believe that there's serious deception yeah. going on. But I'm like, okay, this is your chart. In the case of these two, I really don't think they're competent enough to be deceptive. I do think they're lazy. I think that's why all the charts that they bring up are from the 1990s which was again 30 years ago. So, you know, I don't impart on them necessarily intentional deception because I don't think they are informed enough to be dishonest. That band right there, rec uh, according to the evolutionary model, right. which we need to know better than the world. We don't need to run and hide from this stuff. Yep. Then why are you using charts from the 1990s? Use modern charts. That chart, yeah. when we look at it critically, actually supports the word of God. Yeah. Yeah, and, and they they always will, right? Absolutely. It, it goes back to it. but Then they talk about how there's all these mean professors and scientists out there who say, well, where's the creation model? You guys are always, you know, picking on evolution, but where is the creation model? And they say, well, it's right in that chart because everything seems to appear out of nowhere with no transitional species. And what they seem to forget is that the own chart that they are showing up there that they're choosing to put on the screen shows change within these lineages. Now, of course, this is an outdated chart and the modern church show even more transition within the lineage and indeed join many lineages together. But like the OG creationists, your, your Whitcomb and Morrises suggest that like no evolution happened. So this wasn't a prediction by young earth creationism that there will be limited evolution. They predicted that there would be no evolution ever. So what this is then is accommodation. And this is the theme that I see over and over and over again with the young earth creationism. It only ever accommodates. It never predicts. And here's the thing. It's like, well, thing, there's people now, professor scientists saying, it is our, it's, it's evolved to its maximum. Right. So therefore it stopped. So some things get hit perfection yeah. before they stop. And so that's why the last 150 million years you didn't see anything. You saw all of it change at the beginning. Yeah. But what is that really saying now? Who is saying this, Bob? Bring them to me now. Who is proposing that in the several hundred million years of dinosaur existence, that there was a at least hundred million year period where there was effectively stasis? Show me who's saying that. Bring me one person who's saying that right now. Yeah, I, I love it because it's the same way that the, they had theories on punctuated equilibrium. Yeah. A lizard goes in the egg, a bird comes out. We can't explain it. The <laughs> you literally can't make this stuff up, right? I couldn't, if I made a concentrated effort, script something better than that. These are like two cartoon Disney villains who are supposed to be like the numbskull sidekicks bopping each other on the head with a big rock and trying to come out how to defeat the evil evolutionist. Red goes in. <sighs> Toast comes out. <sighs> you can't explain that. In all seriousness, like birds, the other theropod dinosaurs, and indeed other types of dinosaurs, and also lizards descend from like sauropsids from the Permian. But to be abundantly clear, a lizard didn't lay an egg and then a bird came out. No one has ever suggested that. Ever. And yet it's important to appreciate that the law of monophyly always holds true. This is why birds are dinosaurs and they also descend from dinosaurs. You don't outgrow your ancestry. This is like imperative with regard to common descent. In the same way, we humans are still apes, even though we evolved from an ape. 
We're still monkeys, even though we evolved from a monkey. We're still mammals, even though we evolved from a mammal. And we're still all the way up to the tippy top eukaryotes, even though we evolved from a eukaryote. The, the time, so we just invent something exactly. that helps us get there. There has to be some explanation to point to the fact <laughs> that there's no evidence. You can't just see yeah, exactly. I've got another e explanation. Yeah. It didn't happen. It didn't happen. <laughs> yeah. So, it, so it, it, this is going to be shocking to all of you, but the fact that Bob and Carl do not understand evolution has absolutely zero impact on the fact that evolution is in fact still true and that scientists globally still use its principles to make hundreds of thousands of accurate predictions annually. By the way, we find things in the fossil record that they date, not me, they yep. date 300 and 400 million years old. Yeah. It's so, a whole, whole and they're exactly questions. the same yeah. as what we see today. Carl is talking about the coelacanth here. This is the only example of stasis that he knows, and I would put dollars to donuts on that. Now, the coelacanth is an example of stasis, but stasis is a general term. The coelacanths from the Devonian are not the same coelacanths that we have today. They're just both coelacanths. I'm skipping the jawless fish one. It's just the same thing as the dinosaur example, an outdated chart that they, of course, misread. But there is nothing more egregious than what happens Next, with this chart. Yeah, we found that. We did. Yep, and here's another way of looking at it. Skinny line, bold line. And Skinny if you look line, at bold it, line. skinny line yep. is fable. Fable. Bold line is fact. So this actually what? shows. How, mu how much more fable is there than the, the real? Look at this one. It's a dot. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. What, I mean, it's um, well massive. And what is this of? This is showing how you start over there with uh, the... Uh, a, a fish type Some fish animal, thing. And, and it turns into, into the fish us? all the way down to us and to the amphibians. So, like, they just don't know how to read this. The skinny line means extinct, and the bold line means extant. Not, not fact versus fable. The extinct members have fossil representatives of them, and you can just Google the names. Like, Tularpathon, we just have that. Acanthostega, same thing, we have it. Ichthyostega, just Google a picture, it's right there. But, like, Carl couldn't be bothered. They allude to the fact that sometimes descendants live at the same time as their proposed ancestor, which in actual science, this tends to not actually be proposed at all because it violates the rules of like cladogenesis that people tend to abide by. But that being said, there is nothing conceptually wrong with it. Dogs descend from wolves and wolves still exist. I'd like to see them present an example, especially in their bird evolution, of like a canary being found before Archaeopteryx. That would be very interesting, but I very much doubt it can be done. And then Carl starts complaining about the idea of a groundhog type animal, which that's just like a concept that he's obsessed with. Start with a groundhog type animal. Groundhog, we have a groundhog type animal, right? Groundhog type animal. And then he forgets and calls it a mouse. And that came from a mouse? He cannot comprehend the idea of sequential mutations or natural selection. He just finds the idea absurd, and then he points to, like, hippo sweat glands as something he feels is irreducibly complex. Irreducible complexity as an argument was taken out back and beaten to death the first time we found, like, the sequential pattern of an irreducibly complex structure being sequentially acquired due to every intermediate step serving a function in and of itself. The bacterial flagellum is commonly thrown around, but intelligent design was taken behind the barn and shot with the advent of discovering that nested hierarchies exist both in morphology and constrained regions of the DNA and also unconstrained, unfunctional, or rather non-functional regions. So that argument, done. Kaput. Yeah, well, we see the mice do that every day. It's just obvious that it became a hippopotamus and it, it grew new skin. It went from fur to skin and hair to skin. And As you can see, it's daytime in this room now. It's because that last one, uh, I, I couldn't take it anymore. I just went to sleep. Like the transition here isn't going from fur or hair to skin. The skin was present underneath the fur or hair in the first place. You simply lose the hair. Then Carl and Bub get upset about the fact that also most proboscideans descend from a similarly small 
groundhog type animal. It's good. And then given enough time, the mouse turns into the groundhog type thing, and then the groundhog type thing turns into the big old mammoth thing, and then turns into wow. the bigger animal. But notice something. Notice it becomes a paleo mastodon. <laughs> I mean, if, 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 if that's a fabulous. But look, you've got nothing tying all of this right. together. Zero, zero gaps, 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 and they just. You got groundhog. It sounds like they just found the animals and then said, what did it start with? Yes. And then put some animals up on the picture like a puzzle and went just, well, kind of like that. So let's show Carl and Bob how this is done. On your screen right now, you can see a horse lineage through time. This is a Cenozoic evolutionary transition that is pretty well understood. We have Eohippus with the four clear digits down here at the bottom. It's small, it has four digits and very specific types of molars. Then Mesohippus, which has the reduction, further reduction and indeed loss or near loss of that sort of, uh, I think that's the lateral toe there. So now we're to three toes, but still three prominent toes. It's a little bit bigger of an animal, but it's still linked to Eohippus by the molars. Then we have Merikippus, which has even further reduced uh, medial and lateral digits there, focusing on that primary toe, that primary middle toe in the middle. Again, it's bigger. Again, it's linked to the others by its molars. Then Pliohippus, this thing looks almost exactly like modern horses, except it's still quite a bit smaller. And I believe there's still the preservation in the form of the splints on either side for this critter. And then we have the modern horse. So how are they linked? Well, they're linked through geologic time by their general morphologic similarities. Specifically, dentition is very helpful here. Now, I'm not a horse evolution person, but generally speaking, to my understanding, none of these guys severely overlap in geologic time. Some of them in the middle may a bit, but Eohippus, for example, is not found anywhere near modern horses or even anywhere near Pliohippus. So this meets the very simple prediction that evolutionary biology makes about how organisms change in the fossil record. We see morphologic change, through geologic time, and there is a connecting through line via the morphology, in this case, the, uh, the digits and the dentition. So how would Bob and Carl react to this series of fossils? And again, we have the series. As you can see, we have pretty well representation of several of these guys, all of these guys pictured here. Well, I suspect that they would say, modern horses and Pliohippus are one kind, Eohippus and Mesohippus are another kind, and Merikippus is a middle kind, right? Or they would just say they're all a single kind, or all of them are separate kinds. There is no consistency in how they're designating the kinds, because kinds are not a real biological thing. They don't exist. So, you know, this is a problem, a very serious problem for how young earth creationists like Bub and Carl actually deal with the fossil record, and it's why they don't actually tend to touch the fossils. They say they will later. I'm interested to see how they actually do that. How do they group their kinds? So the especially difficult thing about the kinds, I feel like I haven't underscored this enough in case there are new viewers here, which I'm very sorry that you find yourself here. Uh, but young earth creationists have this idea of progenitor kinds. They think that God creates these kinds at creation and evolutionary change can occur within these kinds, but not between these kinds. It looks something like this, the creation orchard, which is the answers in Genesis classic. So here we have the progenitor canid, the progenitor um, panin. I guess that's supposed to be panin. Sometimes they put it all the way up into like hominids. Progenitor birds, progenitor ceratopsian, progenitor some kind of amphibian, and progenitor, I guess, squamate, because they think that the snake still lost its legs. Um, Okay, how does that map here, right? How does that map with our horses? Because if the creationists are right here, then if each one of these is its own kind, those kinds are not related at all to one another, and yet they can evolve within their own groups. If they did evolve within their own groups, would it not look identical to the between group comparison? None of this makes any sense, but I don't need to tell you that you're already aware. But that's what this whole chart shows is when you go through there and eventually you get even down to people. But you know what? People. Even Bub, whose understanding of evolution is equivalent to a beetle's understanding of evolution, has his like BS detector going off here. He's like, wait, do they really think that we descend from proboscideans from like elephants and stuff like that? 
Of course not. Probosidians are their own separate group. The primate order emerges like 55, probably more like 65 million years ago. And <laughs> probosidians don't emerge until far after that. Forget about that. A groundhog, or I'm sorry, a mouse turning into an elephant, that's not a big deal. No, this is a huge deal. Though. This is a big deal. Where do we go here? Get it? Big deal? Yeah. Elephants are big and whales are also big. Do you get my joke? You got a two and a half inch long mouse with a tail. Yeah. <laughs> yes. That had mutation that eventually became a sperm whale? Yeah. Much less a blue whale? The idea that the incredulity here is coming exclusively from the idea that a small thing evolved into a big thing, that's hard to believe, much less an even bigger thing. This is like a Kent Hovind level of incredulity here. You really think a dog could evolve to be the size of an elephant? I mean, you can drive a Volkswagen Beetle yeah. through the artery of a blue whale's heart, and that supposedly came from a two and a half inch long mouse that had yeah. mutations. Carl here may be confusing the width of a blue whale's aorta or largest artery, which can maybe fit the width of the shoulders of like an adult human man with the fictional eldritch abomination Cthulhu. A classic and easy thing to bungle. I, well, there's no problem because a they, they, they well first of all they don't explain it. Yeah, well, they, they, there it, is it, no explanation. There's no explanation. So, Bub, my good man, please don't confuse your inability to understand the explanation or even your inability to be aware of the wealth of fossils that are actually available for these given lineages with a lack of explanation. Well, a, a guy with a lab coat with six degrees told me the mouse became the whale, so somewhere in that billions of years, it could have happened. And I don't care how many letters you have after your name, none of us know more than God. Exactly. And that's the one yep. we need to be putting our focus yep. on. Yep. If I don't understand it, just can't be true. Sorry. I mean, this feels like such a slap in the face to all the scientists, Christian scientists of course included, who dedicate their lives to try to better understand the natural world around us. If Bob and Carl were in charge, every time we couldn't figure something out, they would just throw their hands up and go, that, shoot, we can't know more than God. Guess you better give up, you dumb loser. These are the kind of guys who, if they lived during the Middle Ages, would be the types to try to have you burned at the stake if you were to suggest that something unknown was due to natural processes instead of magic. I'm not trying to do like the edgelord atheist, he who you believe in magic thing. I'm not even an atheist, I'm a fence sitting agnostic. But this is just such a lazy answer that seems to be reserved only for this particular brand of religious person, like the diehard evangelicals, who don't like the idea of searching for answers in the natural world. If you don't understand it, it has to be something that is just not understandable by its very nature, which is like the antithesis of progress in science. And also, again, what a massive insult to all the incredible scientists who happen to be religious out there who are making groundbreaking discoveries every day while these two dudes sit in what appears to be a box fort and muse about the nature of science that they don't understand or even try to understand. You start down here with a couple Mises. That's plural for mice, right? For mice. Yeah. So you got a couple Mises, and then given enough time, right circumstances to take a look, you get all the different mammals. What are you going to do? Ideally, what you would do is use a chart that wasn't from the 1970s. Yeah, but but it can it goes even deeper than that. We didn't. Oh, yeah. We weren't just animals. We came from a whole oh. other species I like of things. Even right? deeper. That's yeah. another even pun. deeper. Even <laughs> deeper. It goes even deeper. <laughs> Take a listen. Uh, when microbiologist Mitchell Sogan decided to trace human evolution to its roots, he had no idea he might find sponges. Yes, absolutely. Ah, uh, shit. They don't know sponges are animals. So, just for a visualization, right? Peripherins are sponges. They're a part of the animal kingdom. They're one of the major phyla. And we did not descend from sponges. They're a sister group to chordates, another group of animals like nadarians, like arthropodans, like mollusks. I, I mean, I just get really mean when I sense that there is zero effort or very low amounts of effort being put in and I think it's super irresponsible. Like these guys are hoping to have a large audience even though they don't appear to, but they're hoping to get this information out to as many people as possible 
And it is just abjectly wrong in a way that could be corrected with the tiniest, littlest bit of research. That just really gets under my skin. I have a lot of empathy and a lot of sympathy for general ignorance because I'm ignorant on God knows how many subjects. There are some things I know a lot about. This happens to be one of them. So I'm sympathetic to general ignorance. That just means you don't know something. And we all don't know a lot of things. But this is intentional ignorance. And that I will not tolerate. And I will get super duper sassy and mean. And by the way, we can now prove to you beyond a shadow of a doubt that we've all from the sponge because getting rid of athlete's foot yep. is very difficult because it's a fungus. Yes. And so when you're trying to get rid of it, you're killing off a piece of your ancestry. I read that. I literally you really read, read that. I read that. <laughs> and Pete, not lying. I hope there's not an outlet in the room there with them because I wouldn't trust these two alone with an outlet unsupervised. They're going to get themselves killed. It's pretty simple, right? Sponges are animals and animals are a separate kingdom from fungi. So there is no through line here. They just don't know what the fuck they're talking about. Wasting everybody's time here. By the way, we have now found the missing link to we this know. thing. Yeah. This I don't know how to deal with it, quite frankly. We had to bring SpongeBob every now and then there. Okay, sometimes we go a little, a little uh, humor pedestrian, but uh, that's like the dumbest cartoon ever. I just got to be honest with you. It's like the and dumbest cartoon. That's why it's good ever. to use it because it's is that how how ridiculous it may seem. Nah, dude, SpongeBob's hilarious. That's just a bad take. And you know the worst part about this is even Kent Hovind understands that SpongeBob is funny. That's why he uses SpongeBob whenever he can. So Bob and Carl have actually gone below the challenger depth here, the Kent Hovind challenger depth, and they've actually managed to go below the bar, which was already as low as humanly possible. Although we don't have any proof that Bob and Carl beat their wives, so I guess they still have that on Kent. Next, the two of them get upset about like a picture from the Denver Museum that shows cetacean evolution. There, this is from the Denver Museum of Natural History. But you know what I love now, Carl? Yeah. Is all the lines are missing, all yeah. the dots. They just for, forget it. It's just all pictures. Just pictures now. And by the way, notice the how many fossils they have to do it. One, two, three. We got four fossils in there, brother. So you better sell out for it. For all these <laughs> things, the four fossils. But they do. And like, guys, this is a plaque from a museum. This isn't a published cladogram or like phylogenetic relationship. This is meant to be easily understood by children and adults who don't have a background in paleontology. And it's meant to be fun for people who do like paleontology because it's a, it's cool paleo art, right? This, this wasn't published in a journal. How did we get there? What Here is all go. this? There's our chart. This is the one that shows the actual evidence with our couple wolf-like animals, yep. and they turn into all the whales. Anything stand out? Have we taught you anything when you please. look at this chart now? Yeah, please learn at least one thing. Dotted lines, shaded areas are fables. And right? there's question marks. When you look in there, those yep. are all little question marks that they put in there. So now you're beyond the dotted line. You're, you're in the, uh, the I don't know. Absolutely. I have a, no idea. Absolutely. Yeah. It is fable to the core. So I'm going to do my own magic trick for you. You yep. ready? I am. Focus on those skulls. Yep. Focus. Focus. And that's what they really have. I didn't change the skulls. No. Nope. That's the facts. Those are, that's the actual <laughs> evidence right there. It's crazy, okay? isn't it? Christian, non-Christian, we all have the same evidence. How complex that slide before was, and you just take it out, and then you found bones. And you don't even know the order of the bones. It's, it's This chart gave me a lot of trouble with regard to finding it, because they didn't list the citation there. So first what I did is I googled cetacean skull phylogeny, and I milled around on this page for a while, and found nothing even close to really for what I was looking for, for finding that singular picture. I did find this, which was close, but this didn't look exactly like what they had on the screen. So instead, I went back to the video, screenshotted it, and stuck it into TinEye, which had a single search result in the 56.4 billion images that it searched. And when you find this image, you see that it's a screen grab from an old website for like an old college, like syllabus page, or, you know, uh, like Blackboard page almost. So I looked at that and I was like, okay, well, this is the only thing even close to what I'm looking for. So I checked out figure one, which is the, the description here. And I couldn't, I couldn't quite make out the name, but I eventually figured out that it was Barnes et al, 1985. And here it is. 
this is not an open access <laughs> paper uh, because it's from 1985. But that being said, I wanted to show this so you could see that I did in fact find the picture. I'm not showing anything more other than the figure itself, which is no more than what they showed in their video to protect myself from copyright. And you can see that it says phylogeny of the cetacean families Dotted lines indicate no fossil record. In most cases, skulls are the type genus of the, of the family. Uh, numbers at epochal boundaries are in millions of years. So they took this because it matched their dotted line thing and they stuck it into their presentation. So I thought, okay, well, how many cetacean uh, fossils do we actually have um, in this picture? And the answer is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven ish. And then most of the Pleistocene stuff is extant. So I thought, how many cetacean fossils do we have now? Um, and so I went to a list of extinct cetaceans, which is here on Wikipedia. And this actually doesn't even include things like Indohyus or Pachycetus, which Pachycetus was included in this paper here, but Ambulocetus was not. So I thought that's kind of what set me on this journey of maybe it's missing some cetaceans. Um, and it is. Here are some of our <laughs> fossil cetacean species that are not included on that chart from 1985. So as you can see, there are a great many of them and it seems to me as though our friends Bob and Carl are not being as thorough as they perhaps could be. Which is shocking, I know. For the sake of Bob and Carl, though, let's talk briefly about cetacean evolution in like the simplest, babyest possible terms. So here we have a nice diagram. This diagram shows some of the basic players in cetacean evolution. Our hoofed mammal ancestor, Indohyus, then Pachycetus, which is their wolf-like animal, quote unquote. Ambulocetus, which is our individual that is kind of amphibious. It spent its time mostly on the coasts, something that we know because its bone density shows signs of salt and freshwater, implying that it may have lived in deltas. We have, I think that's Cuchicetus. Cuchicetus? Yeah, Cuchicetus. I don't know that one very well. Rhodocetus, I know quite well. Dorodon, and they don't show Basilosaurus. But the point is, is that these guys are all cetaceans, and they do descend from a hoofed mammal ancestor. How on earth could we possibly know that? What if Indohyus and Pachycetus are two just different kinds, and so is Ambulocetus, and only these true cetaceans down here are true cetaceans, <laughs> which is a goofy term um, to begin with. But the way that we know this is by one simple structure of the inner ear, which is a structure called the involucrum. This is found exclusively in living cetaceans, so no land-dwelling animals have an involucrum today. Here it is over on this skull right here. And the interesting thing is this involucrum is found in all of these individuals. The only land-dwelling mammals that have an involucrum are now extinct, and they are Indohyus, Pachycetus, and Ambulocetus. So this is the structure that links them, much like the unique molar patterns linked the horses in horse evolution. And of course, they live through geologic time. So they're showing what? Morphologic change over geologic time. Don't trust us because that's old and outdated. Yeah. Let's go to the current. Let's go to a guy recent here. Take a listen to what he has to say. Instead of finding the slow, smooth, and progressive changes Lyle and Darwin had expected, they saw in the fossil record rapid bursts of change. New species appearing seemingly out of nowhere. Hard work. And then <laughs> remaining unchanged for millions of years. But Patterns hauntingly reminiscent of creation. Quotes from 1999. Yeah, 1999. Again, we saw with the cetaceans, how many cetaceans were discovered, fossil cetaceans were discovered between now and 1985. And I've already discussed how we've more than doubled the hominins since the late 90s and now. So perhaps it is time to use up to date quotes. The last thing they really do is they play this like minute and 30 second video by this guy named Juan who wax is poetic about how impossible he feels whale evolution is he mainly points to the blowhole and he's like the nostrils have to move but the respiratory system has to mutate at the exact same time to accommodate it and then the skeletal system has to do the same thing and it has to reconnect to the blowhole like these are phrases that he is saying uh and to that i say one, most of these mutations that involve structural change are interconnected. So if it changes in one area, it actually influences the development of another area. So it's not like 
You have to have an individual chance mutation in all of these areas at the exact same time. These things do actually induce other areas to change. It's called induction. But more importantly, we see the migration of the global in the fossil record. So here are some examples. Um, I just thought I would pull this up just to kind of cover my basis. Uh, we have the mutation. This is like an older chart as well, but Protocede Day, the Dorudons, all the way up into sort of our Basilosaurus-like critters. And there's the migration of the bulbul. Here's another example here, Pachycetus to Adiacetus to modern beluga whales. I don't think that this is a very difficult thing to show, but again, to these guys, they would just look at this and they would say, well, that's not changed. Those are different kinds, which we've already covered why that's kind of silly. So let's let, let them, let's let them at long last get into human evolution. After all, they titled the video, Am I Unscientific If I Don't Believe I Come From an Ape? So surely they're going to get to it, right? We're going to get into this? We have to get into this, but we can't do it this week. We're going to have to do it next time. We'll see you guys later. Adios. See ya. should have known what a bunch of teases. So that was about as eloquent a discussion on evolution as you would get from two angry macaques locked in a small dog crate. Looking back on my extensive experience watching and interacting with young earth creationists, I think this is pretty bottom of the barrel stuff. This is hovering right around the sort of Kenthoven level of understanding of evolution if not a bit worse. I think Ken Hovind at least understands that a fungus isn't an animal and that a sponge is, I think. But, you know, it is Ken Hovind. Anyways, this video ended up being a lot longer than I thought it would be, but I like to be overly meticulous even with these guys who I don't think should be taken very seriously. We're probably gonna have to come back to them because I just am absolutely dying to know what they're going to say about the... <laughs> human evolution section, which they did not give me despite the fact that it was promised. I think this is a pretty deserved L plus ratio. I think it's actually very appropriate that they were ratioed so hard having now seen the video. I think it would be really funny to ratio them in the YouTube world as well. Give this video more views than you would give that video. Of course, my videos regularly do better than 99 views, so I don't think that's going to be very hard. I don't think that's a tough ask. But in the meantime, if you like what I do, please consider becoming a patron. YouTube AdSense doesn't pay as well as you think it does, and I am a graduate student, so anything helps. And in the meantime, I do hope that you guys take care of yourselves.